Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to fill out the attendance records at the back of the auditorium and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations and if you could give us any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we really do read those and, and take advantage of the ideas that you give us. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dan Fulton. Uh, Dr. Fulton is actually a graduate of Iowa State University and from here he went to medical school at the University of Minnesota, did his internal medicine residency at Hennepin County and uh, now is completing a, an, IV, or an infectious disease fellowship at the University of Iowa. And uh, he actually will be joining the medical staff here at MGMC and at McFarland in August. And he kindly has accepted our invitation to drive over from Iowa City today to update us in community acquired pneumonia. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fulton. OK, thank you. Um, so I'm Dan. Uh, thanks again for having me. It's a real pleasure to come back to Ames and um, be here. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad to be able to talk about community acquired pneumonia too, because it's a topic that I've been interested in since um, residency when I did some work in it uh, back then. Um, as you can imagine, it's a pretty broad topic, um, and there's a lot of sort of sub, sub areas we can get into. And because this is an update, I, I tried to focus on predominantly uh, new information that's come out over the last couple years, um, sort of assuming that um, kind of the, the routine uh, basics of pneumonia uh, you've got nailed down already. Um, so we'll, um, we'll aim to talk about some epi epidemiology. We'll talk about some um, new approval, approvals in treatment and uh, some, some updates and risk factors and maybe a little bit about diagnostics as well. Um, there will be a few audience response um, questions which may or may not have correct answers. So. Um, so when I went through to try and figure out, you know, what parts of community acquired pneumonia to talk about, um, I really tried to aim f about 2011 and after. So within the last four years, I thought that'd be sufficiently new to call it an update. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of studies out there, and I tried to um, focus on things that I thought were interesting, um, hoping that you'll find them interesting too. But it is a somewhat idiosyncratic approach, um, and certainly doesn't uh, cover everything that's been done in pneumonia over the past four or more years. So. Um, that's sort of the broad outline. Um, so uh, pneumonia and I guess influenza is the um, eighth leading cause of mortality in the United States. It's the only infectious cause on the top ten. Uh, so it um, understandably gets a lot of attention in um, you know trying to address it. Although I should note that um, you know it's it's in some ways kind of a natural way to die as well so even though it gets a lot of attention it's um, sometimes kind of a natural uh, end to life. Uh, so th let's do our first question. Um, this is a 66 year old with uh, some hypothyroidism and uh, that's well controlled and she heard about a pneumonia shot on TV and she uh, is interested in getting it. She's up to date on her other vaccines uh, she doesn't smoke and she has multiple grandchildren. So um, kind of the crux of this question is, what would you advise her to do about a vaccine? Uh, is it not really recommended because she's not immunocompromised? Um, it's uh, not really recommended unless, uh, if, as long as her grandchildren all get vaccinated. Um, or maybe she should get the polysaccharide vaccine now and again in five years. Uh, or she should get the conjugate vaccine and that's enough. Or she should get both today, two shoulders equals two vaccines. Um, or she should get the conjugate now and then maybe the polysaccharide in six to 12 months. So um, do you want to take a second to put in some answers? Well, the answers are coming in. I, I wanted to note that um, it is really good to be back here at Mary Greeley. My dad was born here, actually, back in 1954. So um, he apparently had a famous nurse, too, but I, I don't remember uh, her name. But he said um, everybody knew who she was. So um, OK, so that looks like we're about there. So um, moving forward, so she should get the conjugate now, followed by the polysaccharide in 6 to 12 months. So that's. Um, sort of the current uh, recommendation. We'll talk about some of the evidence behind that. So 
pneumococcal vaccines have been uh, coming out over the past several decades. Uh, the first one was the polysaccharide followed by sort of a more broad polysaccharide vaccine. And um, kind of in the early 2000s, there's recognition that the, the sugar-only vaccine didn't create a lot of memory. There wasn't a lot of IgG response. It was mostly just IgM. So the, the efficacy waned over time. So then they linked that to a protein, and that uh, helped get more T memory cells involved and more uh, IgG in the long run. And that was approved for children. And so it started being uh, used, and then they expanded the valency of it. Um, and then finally, um, it ended up being approved for high-risk adults in 2012, and then just recently in 2014 was approved for all adults over 65. And uh, you can see here from these curves that um, this is data pre-conjugate vaccine um, all the way up to uh, kind of before even adults were supposed to be vaccinated with the conjugate. And you can see that the uh, newer data shows a, a bending of the curves um, here, sort of downward in the, the very young and um, the elderly. So um, that sort of led to the speculation that maybe there was this herd immunity going on, because these were predominantly the people getting vaccinated, and yet we were seeing a decrease over here as well. So maybe just decreased carriage in the community was leading to uh, you know, decrease hospitalizations overall. This is when they broke it up by age group, so it was most effective in the very young in terms of preventing hospitalization, and also in the very old. So they estimated from this study that uh, they had prevented 168,000 hospitalizations. Um, I think it's interesting, and it's you know possibly related. Um, I do think it would be important to keep in mind other secular trends that were going on at the same time. For example, people were getting more influenza vaccines around the same time. Um, there was much more robust um, hospice and palliative care that was trying to keep people out of the hospital at the end of life. So. Um, you know, take those data for what they're worth. This was a study that came out of uh, the Netherlands just this year, and what they did was um, the company that makes the, the, you know, the conjugate vaccine also makes a 13-valent urinary antigen so they can test to see if people with pneumonia have the type of pneumonia they're trying to prevent. And basically, they vaccinated a whole bunch of people and um, took a look at if they came in with pneumonia or not, and they basically found that if you took the 13-valent the conjugate vaccine, they could pretty effectively prevent that you get that type of pneumonia. The downside to that was that there wasn't any difference overall in pneumonia in general. So it sort of begs the question what, what else was filling the gap, and also there wasn't any difference in mortality overall. They did show that the vaccine was safe and that um, you know, it, it didn't have significant s side effects when used on a population scale. And I think this, you know, um, kind of gets to the point of, you know, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx are kind of happy places for bacteria to live. And if you eliminate certain types of bacteria, the question is, you know, are there different pneumococcal strains that are coming in or even other strains? Um, I don't know that there's going to be any way to really figure that out uh, until we kind of forge ahead with this vaccine strategy. Um, and there's not too much evidence right now suggesting that it's dangerous. So uh, for now, anyway, the, um, the sort of the immune recommendation people have come up with this algorithm, basically saying that um, if you have not had any vaccination and you're over 65, you should start with the conjugate, and then you can have the, the polysaccharide vaccine a little later. If you've already had the polysaccharide vaccine, you should wait a year before doing the conjugate one. And finally, if um, you did get the polysaccharide before age 65, you should, when you turn 65, go back to the conjugate. So they're really trying to kind of push more on the conjugate. Um, whether or not they expand the indication of this vaccine, I think depends on a lot of things. It's only made by one company, so there might be some, you know, kind of supply chain issues with that. Um, they're not going to revisit these recommendations for another couple years, so maybe by then there will be more data. But I'm not sure there's going to be a way to know the true efficacy of this, because it's a bacteria, um, for several years in the future. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of what's actually causing pneumonia, you know, pneumococcus is thought to be the main cause of pneumonia in adults. Um, this was a study that just came out recently looking at the cause of uh, pneumonia in children. 
you can see that sort of the younger you are, the more likely it's um, a primary viral pathogen, including even mixed uh, viral pathogens, more than one. And uh, then as you age, sort of the, a bacterial pathogen becomes more prominent or not finding anything, um, which is probably a byproduct of not testing uh, for certain things and um, the challenge of really figuring out what causes pneumonia. Um, which brings us to this study. Uh, Daniel Musher is uh, one of the guideline writers from 2007 and worked really hard to try and figure out what causes pneumonia. Um, the problem with pneumonia, as you know, is that there's really no gold standard for what causes it. Uh, we have a lot of indirect measures, cultures aren't perfect, gram stain's not perfect, uh, and because there's no gold standard, that really um, affects our ability to say what's a bacteria, what's not, and what's going to benefit from antibiotics and what won't, et cetera. So this uh, study was a VA study, so it was um, almost all men. 75% uh, smokers, and when they went through, they, they basically found that um, they thought that uh, about, you know, 20% of the time when they retrospectively looked back at all the people admitted with pneumonia, there actually wasn't pneumonia there. They were able to attribute their admission to a non-infectious cause. Uh, and then about, um, let's say, another 20% or more, uh, they had some evidence that there was a bacteria, either culture or antigen or, or something else. And then about, you know, 15% of the time they had evidence of virus or uh, co-infection. And then, as uh, might not surprise you, almost 50% of the time they, they didn't know what was causing pneumonia. So then, um, based on that number, they went back and they, they basically applied these criteria of it's likely bacterial if um, there's no upper respiratory symptoms like runny nose or coryza, and um, there's sort of a biphasic illness, who got sick and then really sick, or they just came in uh, really acutely. Sort of the things that make you think more of a bacterial process. So that gave it a likely bacterial. Uh, likely non-bacterial were none of the above, and then if they had sick contacts or more prolonged symptoms. So then going back, they were able to say that um, of the unknowns, likely bacterial were something around 50% of those, likely viral were quite a bit less. So um, the interesting thing about this study is they didn't do any testing for um, atypicals that I could see, so nothing for mycoplasma or chlamydia or legionella. So, uh, But that's kind of, at least in the VA population, what seems to be causing pneumonia. And then if you look at the organisms they actually found, um, pneumococcus was far and away the most common. And then they extrapolate that into their unknown bacteria and really say that maybe 30 to 40 percent of pneumonia is being caused by pneumococcus. And then you can see some rhinoviruses were found and coronaviruses, and it's hard to, hard to know if this was truly causing pneumonia or if it's just something that was found. So um, one point that I uh, thought was interesting that he brings up here and in a recent review is uh, what about macrolide resistance? Because you know, macrolides are often one of the first-line treatments for outpatient uh, pneumonia. Um, so it turns out that it, uh, at least nationally, there's a high rate of pneumococcal uh, resistance. And uh, in the new sinusitis guidelines, they actually recommend against using macrolide-only treatment due to this high rate of resistance. So uh, I had a question for you. Um, what is the rate of uh, macrolide resistance here or in some of the surrounding communities? And I don't know the answer to this. I'm, I'm curious. So let's see. We'll just move on. So not sure we're probably checking um, the, okay. I think probably the, the micro department is doing some susceptibility on these things. The 20 to 30 percent would be um, close nationally to what they're seeing, and I can tell you in Iowa City it's even higher. We have about a 60 percent resistance to macrolide in our pneumococcus. It's a, you know, university hospital, so it might be slightly skewed, but um, so um, all that sort of leads into, I was just talking about some of Dr. Musher's uh, studies, so um, he was one of the authors here, and this is the last time we had specific guidelines from the IDSA or um, the American Thoracic Society, it was 2007. I broke down the different types of recommendations they made, so you can see that there's a whole lot of um, 
uh, moderate with low quality evidence recommendations here. Um, there's some strong ones, um, but for example, the, the weak uh, number two one that they have is recommending the activated protein C, which uh, as you may know is definitely not recommended and is off the market um, for risk of harm. So these need to be updated. When I talked with Dr. Musher about this, he says they're in the process of being updated, but they've been in process for over a year. And some of that may relate to the challenge of trying to break pneumonia down into one specific guideline, given all the different kind of nooks and crannies of pneumonia, and some of the contradicting evidence and approach between um, pulmonologists and infectious disease doctors when they think about pneumonia. But supposedly, sometime, hopefully in the next year, there will be an update to the guidelines. So in lieu of an update, um, Dr. Musher wrote a review, which I'd, I'd recommend. I thought it was a nice review that got published uh, late last year. And I'd say the, the main thing that um, he wanted people to pay attention to is really thinking through kind of the history and physical as trying to help guide you towards uh, bacterial or a viral cause. Specifically, if people come in really sick really fast, they don't have upper respiratory symptoms, they have a high white count, and then this is another thing. He, he mentions this procalcitonin business, which we'll talk about in a little while. Um, I think that's becoming more and more part of the literature. But I think that's, that was the main point that he wanted to bring up, was really think through bacterial versus viral, and these are some of the things that can lead you one way or the other. And the other thing he wanted to make sure that um, we were aware of is the macrolide resistance rates. And specifically for outpatient pneumonia, um, really, uh, maybe not using macrolide monotherapy, but considering adding amoxicillin or something to cover pneumococcus, which is the most common cause of pneumonia. Um, whether or not that makes the guidelines specifically, I don't know, but if, if they follow the sinusitis guidelines at all, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it did. So take home points from this is uh, vaccination um, is maybe working, kind of bending that curve down. So uh, keep doing it for now. Uh, we didn't talk about smoking cessation, but I, I, that would definitely play a role, and um, you'd do a lot of good if people quit smoking in terms of pneumonia mortality. And it's tough to figure out exactly what's causing pneumonia, which um, pervades a lot of the, the literature about it. Um, so uh, you, sort of, you know what pneumonia is, um, cough, fever, shortness of breath, um, some pulmonary findings, and most definitions require an x-ray uh, or a CT finding. That's based on data out of, um, the, there's the JAMA physical exam series, which I think is great, but they basically found that even if you have classic, classic pneumonia symptoms, the likelihood ratio really doesn't get you high enough to be able to say yes, pneumonia versus something else. So that's why they recommend chest imaging to diagnose pneumonia. The problem is, is that if somebody's really early in the course, you might not see it on an x-ray. They might have other underlying pulmonary or um, cardiac disease that confounds things. Um, or uh, they, the x-ray might just be negative, which throws things off. So um, the other thing that um, I like to talk about that I learned from an infectious disease doctor named Ron Scutt up at Hennepin County was you should always know your oats if you're thinking you might have an infectious process, um, really at any time, um, but pneumonia in particular. So uh, for example, um, if you don't ask, they might not tell you that they were just down in Missouri doing some caving um, which might make you worry more about a fungal process. Uh, maybe they love birds or they take care of sick birds and psittacosis would certainly rise on your differential if you asked about it. Um, maybe for their work they do unexpected travel to the Middle East or West Africa. Um, so it's important to ask such things. Um, anytime they say somebody with pneumonia works for the Postal Service on exam, it's anthrax. That's just what the exam wants you to know. Um, that's pretty rare, it turns out, but on the exam, it's always anthrax. So, um, Or perhaps they just started uh, having chickens in their backyard and uh, managed to get histo somehow. Or um, maybe uh, they are from New York City, but they came back to visit their dad's um, goat farm just south of Ames. Um, which might th make you think about Q fever or uh, coxiaki or sorry coxiella pneumonia. So um, so always know your oats. And I guess the you know I presented at a CME conference about three weeks ago, and all of the presenters kind of independently came to this conclusion that um, screening for HIV is 
continues to be incredibly important. Um, I think, you know, the events in Indiana over the last several months with the outbreak related to needle sharing and oxymorphone injection just show that even in rural areas and people that you don't think might have risk factors, uh, they could still have HIV. And particularly if they're coming in with pneumonia, which we know is increased in people with HIV, um, it's worthwhile screening them. So um, if, you, if you don't ask, they won't tell you. If you do ask, they might not tell you. So um, just screen. And I tell people, you know, it's nothing about you. It's just we screen everybody. So. Um, there's a couple new things coming out in diagnostics, but um, I think it's important not to forget uh, just good um, old school ways of going about things. So um, the gram stain and culture continue to be a very valuable way to get at pneumonia. Um, you know, so this, the problem is some people say maybe the gram stain isn't that practical or that useful. And without a gold standard, it's a little bit hard to know how effective it actually is. It's mostly useful to find pneumococcal pneumonia. So this was a study, older study, that uh, looked at people that had known pneumococcal pneumonia. They had, you know, strep pneumobacteremia. And then they went and they looked at how good was their gram stain initially. So uh, looking at some of the data, um, really the gram stain only saw something 50% of the time and only grew pneumococcus 30% of the time. But that's everybody. Half these people didn't didn't even get a gram stain. So if you kind of look at the ones that actually had a sputum done, the sensitivity went up if they had one done. And so it goes up over 50% and the culture results are more accurate. And then as you know, sputums can be adequate or inadequate. So we don't want spit, we want good phlegm. And so if they're a person that can give you good phlegm, which is a thing you can ask people and they'll probably tell you, uh, if they can do that, um, you can get up to 75% on the gram stain and over 50% on the culture, which is really valuable in terms of figuring out what is your macrolide resistance rate in town or, or whatever. Uh, but a key part of this study was looking at if they got no antibiotics, you know, the rates of return were really good, but the more antibiotics they got in terms of time, these rates just dropped precipitously for pneumococcus. It's a very sensitive bug to antibiotics. So. Um, I would say if somebody had already gotten some antibiotics and if they're saying they're not coughing that much good phlegm for you, it's probably not worth doing. But if they're antibiotic naive and they're saying they have a lot of phlegm, this can be a really helpful test. Um, so uh, this was another interesting piece of um, information that came out last year. It was looking at MRSA nasal PCRs. So a lot of people are getting these done for a lot of different reasons, mostly infection control. So they went and they looked at um, all these patients that had pneumonia, whether community or hospital acquired or healthcare associated, and which of them had both a culture and an MRSA nasal PCR. And uh, what they found was that um, when they took all these people, uh, basically, uh, let's look, find the, if you had a, if you actually had MRSA, the, the PCR would be negative only uh, three percent of the time. So that means 97 percent of the time if you um, it did have MRSA pneumonia, it would be positive. So translating that over into predictive values, if uh, you came in with a community acquired or a healthcare associated or a hospital acquired pneumonia, the negative predictive value of a negative MRSA nasal PCR was incredibly good. So this was a great rule out test for MRSA pneumonia which is kind of a big deal because it might affect the way you'd cover a patient with healthcare-associated pneumonia or community-acquired pneumonia. I'd, I'd say the criticism I would have of this study is that it was not all comer it was all comers and it didn't specifically try and focus on those who actually had risk factors for MRSA pneumonia. So we know from prior studies that patients with these features are more likely to have MRSA pneumonia. So if they have cavities, if they just had influenza, if they're immunocompromised, if there's gross hemoptysis. So all these things sort of would raise your flags that maybe there's MRSA going on. And it'd be interesting to do the same study in a, a population that had a high prevalence for MRSA pneumonia and see if it really holds up. Because I would say if I had a patient come in that had you know, a cavity and hemoptysis and acute onset after influenza and my MRSA nasal swab was negative, I'd ignore it <laughs> until I had better data, um, at least in the absence of future studies. But 
On the other hand, let's say you're in the hospital and your patient has uh, healthcare-associated pneumonia, and you know they had a nasal MRSA-PCR negative just yesterday, um, you might feel more comfortable not covering MRSA. So, um, so here's another case. Uh, this is a 55-year-old that has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and some interstitial lung disease. Three-day history of shortness of breath, cough, sputum production, a little bit of a fever, not that high. Uh, he's had a few sick contacts that have had viral illnesses, and um, he's hypoxic on room air. He's got crackles. Chest X-ray is, like usual, kind of vague, that maybe, maybe not, uh, and the white count isn't that high. So you're sort of left in this gray zone of being worried, but how worried are you? So I wanted to hear your thoughts on this test, procalcitonin. Um, do you use it here? Do you not use it here? Is it available? Is it not available? It is available. Is it a send out? Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, I bring it up because uh, many of the new studies that are uh, coming out are including procalcitonin um, in kind of their algorithms and their analysis of, you know, did this patient have a bacterial pneumonia or not, which is relevant because there's no gold standard. So the more convinced we are there's a bacteria, the more helpful. And um, the studies I'll be referencing are all in adults. They're not in kids, so I can't speak to um, how well it's doing in kids. This was probably one of the earlier kind of clinical studies that tried to look at a number of people. And um, basically what they do with this test is uh, procalcitonin is a pro-hormone to calcitonin. Um, it's thought to be involved in inflammatory signaling. It's released when somebody has elevated IL-1, IL-6, or TNF alpha, so all things that are up, up regulated when somebody has a bacteria, and it's not elevated when somebody has an interferon gamma based inflammatory response, so like a viral response. That's kind of the idea. So then you kind of get this spectrum of results or numbers, and depending on how high they are, you are either encouraged or not encouraged to stop or start antibiotics. So this was a study where they basically gave them some guidance of um, some cutoff values. And you can see that uh, when they did that and they um, followed procalcitonin every 48 hours, initially there wasn't that much difference in the number of people that got antibiotics. But over time, if the procalcitonin remained very low, people were much more comfortable stopping antibiotics. And over the course of a week to two weeks, the total amount of antibiotics that were given was significantly decreased. Well, so what? I don't care about total antibiotics if patients are not doing well. So they, they tried to, and outcomes in this were no different, but that's really the crux of all these studies is do people do worse if you start to limit antibiotics based on this test result? So um, this was another one that tried to look a little bit more real life. This just came out a couple years ago where uh, this was a three-continent study with all sorts of sites. This was the guidance they gave them. So if it was less than 0.1, you're discouraged to use antibiotics, strongly discouraged. If it's 0.25, maybe a little discouraged, and so on. And what they found when they compared to that other data was that, um, again, even in a real-world setting, uh, they decreased the total antibiotics that were used, and maybe more importantly, um, they didn't see a significant change in mortality, ICU admission, complications, um, or deterioration. What they did see was a significant amount fewer of antibiotic side effects, which isn't that surprising because they were using less antibiotics. Things like diarrhea and rashes were the most common. So um, kind of moving that you know, forward a little bit more, this was during the H1N1 um, in 2009 when a lot of people were coming in with a predominantly viral illness and they did procalcitonin uh, compared to uh, C-reactive protein as a differentiation factor between bacterial versus just viral illness. And they basically showed that if you only had isolated H1N1, your procalcitonin was much more likely to just stay low as opposed to if you had a bacterial process, it would go high. Whereas CRP didn't seem to differentiate quite as well between the two. So, um, uh, and what they found when they looked at this data 
kind of subgroup analysis was that if you weren't already hospitalized and you weren't immunocompromised, the ability of this test to differentiate bacterial versus non-bacterial was even better. So at least for H1N1 versus bacteria, the negative likelihood ratio for this test, if negative, was pretty good. Um, so what about outpatients? Uh, this was a study where they basically um, gave half the group kind of procalcitonin guidance and half the group got standard of care. And what they found over time, I think this is the, you can see, this is just who was in the study and then um, they found over time that there was significantly fewer antibiotics given in each group. So I, I was interested in the uh, community acquired pneumonia. So um, a lot of them got antibiotics even though they had a negative procalcitonin or were using that. Um, and there wasn't a lot of difference in terms of poor outcome. Uh, but in kind of upper respiratory like uh, bronchitis here, they were able to prescribe significantly fewer antibiotics out of clinic for outpatients. Uh, without any significant difference in um, kind of symptom improvement, which is their outcome. So, um, and for safety, they had these folks back within 12 hours to take another look, and it seemed like it held up okay. So this is kind of the algorithm that I think people are at least using in their understanding of how procalcitonin works. So if it's less than 0 0.1, it's very unlikely to be a bacteria. And um, this study sort of makes the point that you need to consider other things like are they immunocompromised, how sick are they, obviously if they're going to the ICU and you can't afford to be wrong, then you might not rely on this test. Um, I would sort of think about procalcitonin like you might think about, um, you know, tactile fremitus or egophony. It's, it's another piece of data that can push you towards a bacterial process or not. It's not a perfect test and it's not going to solve all your problems. I think I think the most useful way to use it is going to be if you want to use it in every situation so that you get comfortable kind of understanding how it works. Um, and at the very least, you know, we don't, we don't have it at all at Iowa. Uh, we don't have the platform to run it, so we never use it. Um, it's not really that useful if you have to send it out and you get the information 48 hours later. Um, but the turnaround time is like 20 minutes if you have the platform. Um, so I think it's something to consider in a patient where you're on the fence and you think, you know, I, they're, they're maybe not having a bacterial pneumonia. Uh, maybe I'll check this and if it's very low, consider not using antibiotics and maybe doing some closer follow-up. So in general, gram stain, sputum is still useful, I think. Um, uh, MRSA nasal probe, I think, is uh, going to be a very useful test in ruling out MRSA pneumonia. And at least be aware of procalcitonin as a uh, diagnostic test because it's being reported in all the literature about pneumonia right now. So new things about treatment. Um, so the first thing in treatment is where, the, where is the patient going to go? Can they, you know, go back home? They have to be admitted or go up to the unit? Um, uh, there's not really been a ton of new information about um, predictive factors about where patients end up. These are the two most common that are in all the literature. Seems like there's a number of kind of home brewed, like at our institution, this is the best way to predict. And really, they're very similar to this. And this is what's used in the literature. Um, the, the pneumonia severity index is this long, somewhat complicated point system that is used for researchers. And then um, the British folks came out with CURB 65, which is uh, much more user friendly and um, has been essentially equally validated. So in CURB-65, if you have 0 to 1, your risk of mortality is very low, less than 2%. If you have two risk factors, then it's a little higher, around 10%. And if you have uh, three, then you're up into the 22% mortality. So these are generally thought of as unit players. These are floor players, and these are outpatients. Um, same thing with the pneumonia severity index. They sort of break it up, and you can see that the percentage of mortality and kind of different validations is sort of similar with uh, CURB-65. So um, I'd say that's not much different. So let's talk about another case. Um, so this is a 70-year-old with a history of AFib, um, presenting with cough and fever over three days. He uh, recently had a knee replacement five weeks ago. He was in the hospital for four days. Uh, at that time. He doesn't have sick contacts. He's pretty alert, but he's febrile, hypoxic, and he's got a little bit of AKI. He has an infiltrate. That's very easy to see, um, but he's stable. You rule out some non-infectious uh, causes, and maybe you even get a procalcitonin that's elevated, so you're 
very sure this patient has pneumonia. So uh, there's your input rate. So the question is, is how are you going to treat this patient? Probably going to go to the floor based on having two CURB-65 factors. And let me just say, too, about CURB-65 and pneumonia severity index, um, those are guidance things. Uh, you know, they can help you predict, you know, risk of mortality, but I, I think one important feature is that if there's something about the patient that even though they don't fit CURB-65, but they seem like they belong in the unit, just go with that because that's a, this is a tool to predict mortality and risk, but it's not 100% sensitive, and the risk of being wrong with it is, you know, if somebody ends up on the floor, they should be in the unit. Um, that's a bad thing. So uh, I would say use them as guidance, but, you know, I would never argue like, oh, well, this is only a CURB-65 score 2, so they can't go to the unit if there's something about them that makes you think they should. Okay, so moving on. So in terms of this guy, um, so that's good. So he, um, it's a few features that you might have noticed about him. So he was recently hospitalized, so he would fall into the healthcare-associated pneumonia category, not community-acquired specifically. Um, he's on the floor. So one challenge um, is that the healthcare-associated pneumonia guidance that we have was published with the ventilator associated pneumonia guidelines. So healthcare associated pneumonia was put in with more severe pneumonia as opposed to with less severe pneumonia. And what that's led to is a much more aggressive treatment of healthcare associated pneumonia, even for outpatients or for people that aren't currently in a nursing home or in a hospital. Um, so if you were really concerned, this is like, you know, a, a hospital acquired pneumonia, you might go this route, treating more aggressively. On the other hand, if you were thinking this is kind of more of a community-acquired pneumonia, um, you might treat less aggressively. Um, so this would be the only sort of guideline-approved uh, community-acquired pneumonia treatment. We'll talk a little bit more about that. This would be a, a good hospital-acquired treatment. So would this, and this is also a community-acquired pneumonia um, treatment strategy. So the only, the only answer that I think the guidelines would consider incorrect would be ceftriaxone, and I'd say even that is up for debate, and we'll talk about that. So this was an interesting study that came out um, from Japan, and basically what they tried to do is um, delineate this healthcare-associated pneumonia um, into risk factors. So people that have recently been in the hospital or coming from a nursing home are not a, a monolithic group. There's a lot of variation, and so they looked at risk factors, and then they prospectively tested their theories. So they said in addition to being in a nursing home or recent hospitalization, if you had gotten recent antibiotics, um, had poor functional status, or were immunosuppressed, those were additional risk factors for having more severe pneumonia. Um, and if you were going to the ICU, they separated floor players from unit players. So if you went to the floor and you had only zero to one risk factors, then you could treat like they had community-acquired pneumonia. On the other hand, if you had more than two risk factors, then you would treat more like hospital-acquired pneumonia. On the other hand, if they went to the unit, if you had any risk factors at all, then they, they recommended that you just get treated like hospital-acquired pneumonia based on they're, they're so sick you don't want to be wrong. So how did this do? What was interesting about this is if you had zero to one risk factors, the likelihood that you had MRSA, even with healthcare-associated pneumonia, was zero. They didn't find any. And the likelihood that you had pseudomonas was very low. So only three out of 151. So the point they're trying to make is that you shouldn't treat all healthcare-associated pneumonia the same. You can kind of risk stratify patients into needing MRSA and pseudomonas coverage or not um, based on their risk factors. And I think the future guidelines will address that. And in fact, um, uh, healthcare-associated pneumonia is being pulled out of the, the hospital and ventilator-associated pneumonia guidelines and will be, I think, put in with community-acquired pneumonia um, when those come out. So, um, and uh, this is, uh, he, um, Dr. Wonderink is a pulmonologist from Chicago. He was also on the guideline committee from 2007 and is um, on the current guideline committee. And he also uh, wrote a nice review just last year, again, because of the delay in updated um, uh, guidelines. And I'd say his main sort of things he was interested is in us thinking about was this risk stratification of healthcare-associated pneumonia, 
and um, really thinking about specific risk factors for resistant organisms, which would change your therapy. So for example, if they don't have any risk factors for MRSA pneumonia, um, you may not need to cover it. But I, that was also a really worthwhile uh, review. I'd recommend it. So, um, uh, so after medical school, I um, moved to Guatemala for a year and um, did some volunteer work. And uh, they asked me to give a, a presentation about pneumonia to the local health promoters. So there's 40 health promoters in the valley who were doing the majority of the treatment. And the big question for them was, do we need to cover atypical pneumonia or not? Can we just use amoxicillin or do we have to add atypical coverage? And so even seven years ago in a different country, that was the main question. And it's a question that continues to cycle around and it kind of seems like a, a pendulum that for a while it's recommended and for a while it's not. It turns out the European guidelines don't recommend adding a macrolide for mild to moderate pneumonia. Uh, obviously, our guidelines do. So this was a study that came out late last year. It was a placebo-controlled trial where they basically gave people monotherapy versus ceftriaxone and azithromycin. And what they were looking for was non-inferiority of um, the monotherapy uh, study. And basically, they defined success as reading clinical stability, reaching uh, clinical stability, and so they basically found that people in the monotherapy group didn't seem like they reached uh, clinical stability at the same rate as people in the combination therapy, so p-value of 0 0.7. And then also there was this finding of uh, increased readmission rates if you got monotherapy, like if you didn't get a macrolide. So their conclusions on this and other people that have referenced this study is that yes, in fact, the guidelines are correct. and uh, if you give ceftriaxone, you also need to cover atypicals with a macrolide. Uh, the question is, is are you actually treating something with a macrolide, or are you just kind of uh, harnessing its anti-inflammatory effect? I don't, I don't think people really know that. And then um, just this week, I was kind of reviewing things again to see if there was any late hits before I came over, and I found this study. So this was just published in New England Journal two weeks ago. Um, I'm sorry, it's kind of small. I'll explain it. The, uh, the upshot to this was this was also a... a um, it was a cluster um, controlled trial where there was a number of sites and for four months they were recommended that they use monotherapy versus dual therapy versus equinolone. And they sort of went around and they were looking to see is monotherapy inferior or not to dual therapy. Uh, so this was a bigger study than the last one, although not exactly placebo controlled. And uh, basically what they found is if you compare uh, beta-lactam alone to beta-lactam plus, say, uh, macrolide, that um, there wasn't any difference. So with non-inferiority trials, you're looking for kind of does, does this arm of uncertainty cross kind of this boundary of uh, what is usually um, around 10% different. So they found in this trial that there was no difference, that you could use just ceftriaxone and not add a macrolide. Um, so where does that leave us? I don't really know. Um, I think, you know, the Europeans might be right and you don't need to treat it. Um, on the other hand, um, that last trial said maybe you do need to use a macrolide. I, I think that's up for debate, but what this trial leads me to wonder about is I don't think it's necessarily wrong to not use a macrolide because there's data supporting that. Uh, and I'd be surprised if new guidelines strongly recommend always using macrolide since now there's this really pretty good data saying maybe it's not that helpful. Um, and we'll talk about the risk of macrolides a little bit later because that's been something that's come out the last couple of years. So uh, this was another trial that just came out this year. This was the use of steroids in severe uh, pneumonia. Um, and basically what they did in this trial was they tried to um, stratify people to a very high CRP and going to the unit. So looking at people that had a strong inflammatory response. And if they had that, they got steroids. And they found that it was effective basically in this. They were able to show that if you got steroids, you had less radiographic progression. So they said everybody should get it. Well, I would say I'm not sure changes in the x-ray is a significant finding. Um, so I, I would not do this yet. I would wait and see if they're able to bear this out in more studies. Um, yeah. Uh, this was an interesting study. I think we'll skip over in the interest of time. Um, I think it was too kind of biased. Uh, there is a new drug that's been approved for community-acquired pneumonia. It's ceftaroline. Um, ceftaroline I think of as ceftriaxone plus MRSA coverage. Um, 
these studies specifically excluded anybody who might have MRSA based on risk factors or culture positivity. They only treated community-acquired pneumonia people, and they basically found that through a series of studies, uh, it's um, non-inferior to ceftriaxone. Um, and in fact, some people think it might be a little uh, superior uh, when you kind of look at all this data, and I think the idea is it's less protein-bound and has a longer half-life. But given its extended MRSA coverage, I don't think that I would start using this for community-acquired pneumonia yet, unless um, you're worried that they have these risk factors for um, MRSA. Then it might be an attractive option. But you should note that this has not been studied specifically for MRSA pneumonia, although I'm sure uh, the makers of this drug are working on that. So um, another series of studies that came out was about azithromycin and the risk of cardiac death, basically. So this was a study that just looked retrospectively at big databases and found that there was a slight increase in death if you were on azithro. The number needed to harm was something like 20,000. Um, people. Uh, the Europeans came back and said, well, what about if you just do it in young people that don't have cardiac disease? And they found no association whatsoever with cardiac death. And then finally, in a VA population, this just came out last year, uh, they actually found that if you used azithromycin in people with pneumonia, there was a decreased risk of death. So all that to say, I think that azithro can affect QT and other things. So if you have a patient that has heavy cardiac disease, and is elderly, I would try increasing monitoring while you're treating them with a the macrolide um, as you're going. Uh, so those are the basic take-home points. Think about risk stratifying. Um, one thing about treating with a macrolide versus uh, a beta-lactam is if you find pneumococcus, I think you can drop the macrolide. I would just, if you find a bug you think you can target, I would just target that organism. You don't have to keep the macrolide on for a theoretic benefit of anti-inflammatory properties. I think you can just focus on what you know you have. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, pneumonia, the prednisone data, I think, is not strong enough yet. Uh, ceftaroline is out there, maybe, if you were worried about MRSA risk factors and um, increased monitoring for azithromycin. So um, I think we'll kind of leave it there, see if there's any questions. Don't remember, or remember that treatment is um, five to seven days. and. Um, if things aren't going well, what we think about is wrong bug, wrong drug, or sanctuary site. So is there pus hiding somewhere that needs to be liberated, or um, is there a bug that you're not covering? And they recommend really approaching that in a systematic way. So if they're just failing to improve in 72 hours, that's kind of a normal response. But if they're getting worse or they're not improving after 72 hours, then uh, you might think about changing course. So. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate being here. And um, if there's any discussion or questions, I'd be happy to hear. It. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, a gram stain is uh, worthwhile with the sputum if they haven't gotten antibiotics. Do you have a time frame on that? Uh, is that hours of antibiotics or three days ago? Or um, So the, the data, at least, that Musher showed is that um, if if it's been more than 24 hours, the yield is going to be very low, um, and they seem to start seeing dropping of yield after about six hours. So uh, pneumococcus, is, is, uh, it just explodes in the presence of penicillin. So um, although some of these future diagnostic testing, like um, PCRs and stuff, it won't matter if the bug is alive or not. So there's some multiplex-type PCRs coming out that will probably be used eventually. In that case, it probably won't matter if they've gotten antibiotics or not. So, sir. Dan, thanks for the excellent presentation, and we are here to see you in August. Um, so uh, regarding procalcitonin use locally, we do have it. We have it as inpatient, and um, it's been a little bit frustrating, to tell you the truth. I think because we were too enthusiastic and we regarded it as a holy grail that would tell us whether somebody has a bacteria or not, and we started using everybody, um, I think your presentation allows us to focus more, probably pneumonia, there's a good... Um, base of evidence to say, okay, if you use it, as you said, as another factor, as uh, the same as crackles, egophony, fever, and whatnot, you know, to the side to put in the balance whether people have bacterial infection or not, probably that's a better, the best use we can have for it, right? Uh, I, I and, think so. Um, it's it's FDA approved for severe sepsis. That's its, right. it's not actually approved for pneumonia for what it's worth. Um, and I do, I do wonder about the cost effectiveness of using it in everybody, which I think would probably be the best way to learn how to use it and interpret it. Um, 
I haven't seen good cost effectiveness data. You know, if you're using it in everybody, how much how much benefit do you get for your buck? You know, I I don't know that. So in pneumonia, you would recommend we use it on people who are in the um, I mean in the you you could think they have a viral infection versus yeah. a bacteria. I mean, is that the, the best clinical so. use think, you would have? I think if you're thinking about using antibiotics as a risk mitigation strategy, mm -hmm. not because you actually think they have pneumonia, but you're like, it could be, let's use antibiotics, that might be a good person to get a procalcitonin. And if it's very low, and, and the lower, the more confident you can be, then that might be a place to use it. So outpatient definitely would make a lot mm -hmm. of sense, right? We have it as inpatient at this point. And yep. I think outpatient is, and for inpatient probably de-escalating antibiotics, right? I mean, following the serial procalcitonin, and if you know yeah. it started off like 15 and it's normal, probably. Yeah, so. the, the recommendations are if it drops by 80%, mm -hmm. um, but you have to have you know separation in time and kind of be following it serially. So if it's very high and it goes down 80%, you can be reasonably assured that any bacterial driving an inflammatory process are resolved. Wonderful. That's Thank what you. they'd have us believe. You know, I, I think when I've talked to people about it, the real world experience never seems to be quite as good as the data suggests. So. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.